pleasure of being able to introduce Anil today. And for those of you that have not attended any of these, let me give you a little bit of history. So the celebration of faculty careers came from two actions uh, of the strategic plan for the College Engineer. The Faculty of 2020, with its focus on professional development at all stages of our career, and the alignment of criteria and processes for hiring and promotion and tenure with the evolving scope of the College of Engineering and its leadership values. A desire was expressed by someone for a review post-promotion to the rank all the way to full professor that would feature the accomplishments of the faculty and provided also an opportunity to plan for the next phase of a faculty member's career. Full professors who are at least seven years past promotion present colloquia on their achievements and their plans uh, to their peers. And this is followed by a planning discussion with their deans and their heads and uh, uh, other senior individuals. This was piloted successfully in the spring of 2013 and it had full implementation in the 13-14 academic year. So, you all know Anil, but just uh, a little bit of background for the, the video. Anil Dijaj is the Al Alpha P. Jameson Professor and William E. and Florence E. Perry, Head of the School of Mechanical Engineering. He joined the Purdue faculty in January 1981 after completing his PhD studies in mechanics from the University of Minnesota. He obtained, respectively, bachelor's and master's degrees in mechanical engineering, from the uh, IIT at Karagpur and the IIT at Kanpur. Dr. Bajaj's research and teaching interests are quite broad. They're in the area of linear and nonlinear systems, analytical dynamics and modeling of multi-body systems, stability of elastic systems, bifurcations and chaos in mechanical systems, nonlinear stability in fluids and fluid structure interactions, dynamics of seat occupant systems, Malling of viscoelastic properties of foam and design of nonlinear resonant MEMS. And I think that's captured up here in three lines. <laughs> so we'll hear the rest in terms of the details from Anil. <coughs> Thank you, Melba. Um, or Dean Crawford. Uh, <clears throat> it's a, really an honor to be able to talk to you guys as part of this celebration of faculty careers. Uh, as you saw, uh, I'm surprised it's at April Fool's Day, so hopefully um, it will be all fine. Uh, <clears throat> so existence of a faculty member for so long, um, I think I'm older than some of you in the audience. Uh, so that means that uh, I have received significant help and support from everybody. Uh, from most, okay? And so that's the first thing I want to say. I'm thankful to all the collaborators as well as the rest of the faculty, not only in mechanical engineering, but in College of Engineering and across campus for allowing me the existence and uh, to the point that I was willing to apply for the headship, okay, of the school. But today I'll mostly talk about, <clears throat> so this is, um, um, some outline of the talk. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the background of Anil Bajaj and some introduction and scope of this presentation, uh, talk a little bit about some initial research in dynamical systems, and then more recent research in the last few years, and then say a few words about my service to the school or administration and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> Now, afterthought here is really what I realized was I had not included in all this. So I thought at least I should put it out and at least uh, try to complete and give credit to everybody. And I'm sure even after this afterthought, I have missed out lots of people. OK, so the background, as uh, Melba already talked about. So I did my bachelor's degree uh, in 1973 five-year degree program, not four-year degree program, from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. And this is how the main building of IIT Kharagpur looks like. And then I did, and you know, in all of these things, there's lots of stories. And uh, I'm sure my kids have heard those, some of those stories, but not everybody. And so depending on 
um, how I see you guys smiling or not. I'll sometimes say some of those stories. Uh, then I went to IIT Kanpur for my master's degree. And uh, that's how it looks like. These are, that's the actually, this is library, which was built, well, IIT Kanpur was one of the IITs. And this was the IIT which was built with US help. And in fact, the librarian of um, IIT Kanpur library, first librarian, was the librarian of the maths science library here, Mr. Richard Funkhauser. Okay. And <clears throat> so there is, and in fact, we had a faculty member in ME, uh, Val Burkdolt, in the design area. And he had spent first three years in the startup of IIT Kanpur. Anyway, so I had wonderful experience there. I did my master's degree there. And then I went to Minnesota. And this is how, actually, unfortunately, this is the new aerospace engineering and this thing building, not the old one, which I remember. OK. What, what about, are the, is that the way it looked in the 70s or now? Which? Like these looked at that time also. Yes, that has not changed much. So here is my graduating class, OK? And I did not have that picture. It's only last few years that uh, I joined a IIT KGP Google group. Yes? Are you wearing a tie? No, hell no. <laughs> here I am, OK? I'm sure that would have been a quiz, recognize who is Bajaj here, OK? He's not wearing a tie. No tie, OK? <laughs> yes. Uh, in so fact, sorry. I don't even have a jacket there, OK? So yes, true to the spirit. Uh, that has remained throughout my life. OK, so in fact, it's interesting that uh, a colleague, of, a friend of ours, he put down these names here by trying to memory. And he says, memory fails, memory fails, and so on. And uh, luckily, I could recognize all the professors. And I can tell you the names. Okay, So it's a very small class. Fortunately, unfortunately, that was a rare year at IIT, in IIT's history. And the 1968 batch entering to all five IITs was the smallest ever. Okay? For whatever reasons that took place, the previous batches were usually of the order of around 300 students going to each IIT, whereas this batch was around 150 students. And so we had only 28 students in our, which meant that Every professor remembered our name, OK, which meant that other implications from there. OK, all right. So let me talk a little bit about more introduction. So at IIT Kanpur, I decided to do research. Uh, now, I had too many interests, okay, which is still true. OK, and so I was interested in machine tool dynamics, machine tool risk machine chatter, and so on. I was interested in control theory. I was interested in optimization theory. And at that time, uh, what happened, the professor, who was very much interested in doing finite element and optimization, he was in so much demand that practically the whole class, MTech class, wanted to work with him for. And you all know that person, or many of you know that person, SS Rao. Okay. So I also sat in front of his office waiting for my turn to go and ask whether he has a project I can work. Well, in the meantime, the rest of the faculty complained vociferously to the head of the department. We are not getting any grad students. Okay? So the rule was made by the they call the postgraduate faculty committee that uh, unless all faculty members get at least one or two students, no faculty member could take additional students. So I said, OK, I will be the first one to give up. And I worked with, I said, OK, who don't have a student? I said, I'll work with them. And I worked on linear stability of planar jets. All right? So that's completely different than what I, I did take a few courses in fluid mechanics and so on. But <clears throat> all right. So what was this linear stability of jet flows? Uh, planar jet is basically, uh, I'm sure all the Paul Soika can explain much more than I can. But basically, if you take a, 
infinitely long slit, but the slit size is infinite small, okay? And a fluid is injected from there out, and fluid is coming out into the same medium, which is stationary, right? So water coming out into water, air coming out into air, and so forth. And so uh, on, what happens is because the slit size is infinite small, everything is really defined in terms of the momentum of the fluid that is being injected out, okay? Of course, what happens? As this jet flows out, it is going to start entraining fluid from the sides. This is into an infinite, semi-infinite fluid. And so the jet, whatever way you define the area of the jet or volume and encompassed with the jet, that slowly starts growing in some manner in a conical fashion. So you not only have a axial flow, you also have a transverse flow. And this axial flow is not a constant velocity independent of x, but hopefully it's slowly growing, not fast growing, right? Okay, so you want to study its stability. So that's a very classical problem. And uh, <clears throat> so parallel flow model is not fully valid because the, it slowly is expanding. And so the f stability analysis, one of the classic ones was by Sato in 1960. And <coughs> the classical method for parallel flow stability analysis is something called, you introduce perturbations in uh, Navier-Stokes equations and make the assumptions of planar flows and all that stuff. And what you get is something called or Sommerfeld boundary value problem. And it is a tough boundary value problem to solve. It is singular. And uh, in those days, they were constructing numerical methods for solving those. Okay, So there are NASA codes that were available for a few of them. But because the flow is growing, uh, Professor Joseph, his one student, he had a PhD thesis and said, so because of this slow growth, the Orr-Summerfield model is not the right model for this, and we need to modify that equation and do something else about it. So there was a modified Orr-Summerfield equation which appeared in Applied Mechanics Reviews, and just around the time I was doing my master's degree, I had started my master's at 74 or so. I think this date may be wrong. And so this is the modified Orr-Summerfield equation. Okay? And this is a linear operator. V is the perturbation to the axial flow, okay? And so V can be represented in the form of this, something which depends only on Y, and a temporal and a spatial wave number, okay? Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the theory, but just the ultimate result, how do things look like. So the results in linear stability theory usually are presented in terms of what's the basic parameter, that's Reynolds number. As I increase the Reynolds number, what happens to the flow? So essentially, what happens to the flow means essentially, is this profile going to remain stable? If I give a small disturbance, it is going to remain as it is, or these disturbances will start growing and you will start forming vortices and so forth. Okay, and here it is, uh, this is the, um, as a function of kr, so the spatial wave number. And these are for different values of the imaginary parts of the uh, <coughs> wave number. And so they represent really the growth rate or decay rate in spatial direction. And so these are parameterized by it. And then there is the frequency of oscillation along this curve. So essentially, neutral curve means that ki is equal to 0. Okay, And so. This is for the parallel flow theory, and this is for the modified parallel flow theory. So what's that? A theoretician, how do I know which is correct? Okay. Luckily, Sato had done experiments, and uh, he had seen in the experiments that the Reynolds number at which the jet became unstable was around 10, whereas the parallel flow theory predicts around 4. Okay. And for whatever fortunate or coincidence, this modified theory predicts around 11.4. So that's just a one data point to say this may be certainly a better <coughs> model. Okay, so that was IIT Kanpur, okay? <coughs> uh, 
So there are, again, stories in life. So whatever they say, fork, right, on the road. So one of the professors at IIT Kanpur said, stick around here. You have done enough work. If you do one more or two more years of work, you will get a PhD. And we like you. You are good enough. And I, we can promise you we'll give you a lecturership position. Uh, for whatever coincident, that year they had two assistant professors. One was PhD from British Columbia, and one was PhD from Stanford. Okay. And they were as hired as assistant professors. So I said, well, these two gentlemen you have hired as assistant professors, and you are saying to me, if I finish my PhD here, I'll be hired as a lecturer. If you promise, you will hire me as assistant professor. I do PhD here. Otherwise, I'll go outside, do PhD there, and come back. And then you give me assistant professor position. So that was the pact with understanding with them. He said, OK, you can go. Uh, <clears throat> and so that was the decision to come to USA. Okay, With all the intention that I'll, and I did apply, unfortunately, they still gave me a lecturer's position. <laughs> while Purdue gave me an assistant professor position. So that's where things happen. All right? OK. Uh, <clears throat> so as you saw, I went to fluid stability. And then I saw all kinds of the books by J Dan Joseph and so on. So I said, OK, it'll be great to study at Minnesota with Dan Joseph. And I got a teaching assistantship to do PhD. When I get there, Dan is on sabbatical. And all his students, a few of them were Indian origin. In fact, from IIT Kharagpur, a couple of them were. They said, well, Dan has stopped working in stability theory. He only works in viscoelastic fluids now. Okay? So I said, what do I do now? Okay? And Dan was going to come back. This was September of 1976. And I was, he was not going to be there for six more months, and so on. So I started taking classes in continuum mechanics, dynamical systems, and so forth. And then the professor who was teaching dynamical systems at the end of the semester quarter system, he said, well, I have a project. And uh, do you want to work with me? No commitments for PhD. Okay, I just need a guinea pig to help me out or my PhD student to finish some work. And <clears throat> you seem to have understood whatever I taught in class in dynamical systems. So I said, fine. But that's what then remained for four and a half years after that, even after Dan Joseph came back. So I joined PR Sethna's dynamical systems group. Professor Sethna's group only always consisted of one student. <laughs> OK? He was, what were the visa issues? Pardon? What were the visa issues? Oh, the visa issues. OK, so that's another story. All right, so India was in good books of United States in those days which meant that a large fraction of the people, students, who went to get student visa were denied visa. Okay. Now, whether that was because the Indian government was, had requested the US government to do this, which is quite possible, rumor under, okay, or it was because of the relations, because Mrs. Gandhi was the prime minister and so forth, for whatever reason. So. Uh, <laughs> A few students from IIT Kanpur, like I, had, I was supposed to go for visa on Monday. A few students from IIT Kanpur came back the previous week, and they were all crying. They had all been rejected. Their visa applications had been rejected. So they went to the head of the department and said, do something about it. And at that time, the science advisor science and technology advisor to the US ambassador, was actually a professor from University of Massachusetts, who had been one of the faculty members at IIT Kanpur. So these people were given letters by my head of the department to say something about, you know, good guy, why don't you help them get the visa and so forth, OK? Uh, so that's what they were doing. Uh, and they were going back to Delhi and see if they can get visa. 
So that's how the story. So I was also given a letter. I never opened that letter. I said, I'll see if I need to use it, then I'll worry about it. But I was, they had called me and said, you are going there. I know that. OK, so here's a letter. You can take it and take it directly to the attache um, <clears throat> science officer, and he will help you. OK, I didn't go there, but luckily on that day, it's true, out of 30, only two people were issued visas to come to US, myself and another Mr. Bandopadhyay, and he went to Amherst. Okay, that's all. Everybody else's visa was application was rejected. So I don't know what is the reason, but that's you know um, there are some so other. Letters didn't help. Pardon? So letters didn't help. Uh, some help. <coughs> okay. Uh, so again, as I said, Professor Setna, his group would have one or two students, usually one. He would have usually an NSF grant or a Air Force grant. He will hire one student. He will work with the student like hell, right? So like hell means like 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. in the evening, he'll be working with the student. And they will decide, yeah, this is a good idea. Let's try something here and so on. And 8 o'clock in the morning, next day, he will be at your door and say, did you try it? Did it work or not? And so on. OK, so it was tremendous pressure that the output was needed. Okay. Well, it was not because he wanted to pressure you, but he was excited about the outcomes. Right? OK, so <clears throat> the thing was that nonlinear vibrations, I still call it nonlinear vibrations, though most of my colleagues now call it nonlinear dynamics. I try to distinguish between the two. The local bifurcation theory, that was gaining fashion. And, but the applications in mechanical systems is very much in infancy. Okay. And so, you know, nonlinear structures, elastic stability, a very important area concept called follower forces, that was gaining significant amount of notoriety. There was a lot of effort in that direction because follower forces, what happens is static stability criteria and dynamic stability criteria give different results. And that used to be called a paradox. Okay. And so, and then there were a few classics appearing just then. One is George Herman's uh, very classic NASA technical report where he talked about Elast elastic stability, follower forces, and so on. Uh, Thompson and Hunt's, Hunt's book on elastic stability of elastic structures, and Marston and McCracken's book on half bifurcation. Those things appeared at that time. Okay, so these are the classics. So this is around, you know, early 1970s. This is 73, and this is 1976. And luckily or unluckily, my advisor got the first few copies of this book to review for Siam Review. Okay, so which meant that I had to read the book or help him read the book. Okay. All right. So I had to dive into dynamical systems or weekly nonlinear systems, learned asymptotic, averaging theory, and so on. And so the idea was to marry nonlinear vibrations with nonlinear dynamics. Okay? And again, this is a kind of a conversation in a beltway. Some of you will appreciate. Most of you will say, who the hell cares? Okay? And that's perfectly fine. Uh, so the first things I started doing was self-excited oscillations of structures with internal flows. And Herman, George Herman in uh, Stanford had a PhD student who had just finished doing a problem on that. And then uh, this was my PhD thesis, bifurcations in systems with rotational symmetry. Okay? That was the first time it was done in dynamics. Um, and for the first five years, that was the most cited paper in that area. But after that, mathematicians took over, and now they never cite me on that topic, okay? They only cite each other. Uh, <clears throat> then came the faculty opportunity at Purdue. Okay, I interviewed in June 1980. I think a week after Professor Krauskill interviewed, there were two faculty openings here. 
in the mechanics area, in, di in dynamics, vibration, and so on. And late Professor Joe Jenin, he was the chair of the mechanics area, and he recruited both of us. Okay? Again, as I said, everything has a story behind it. Right? So the story behind it is, when I applied to Purdue, Professor Jenin called me and said, are you a permanent resident? I said, no, I have a student visa. So I said, well, our head says, and the head at that time was Professor Arthur Lefebvre, that the head says, no international students. Because our international students and scholars program says, we don't want to struggle with trying to go through the visa process and so on. Okay, So if I don't call you, understand that not that you are, we like you, everything, we would like to recruit you, but we can't do this, right? Well, luckily, a month later, he called again. He said, well, finally, our head has agreed to interview you. So that's what happened, okay? And the day I came here, there were only, actually, there was only one faculty member who came to my seminar. There were a total of four people in the seminar. Arthur Lefebvre, Bob Fox, Joe Jenin, and Ray Sipra. Okay. So thank them that I'm here. <laughs> or <laughs> whatever, All right? OK. So assist I joined in January 1981, as Melba said. And I was um, promoted in April 85, and then it, <clears throat> again in April 91 to associate to full. And then the school was kind enough to appoint me as Alpha P. Jamison Professor in December 2009. OK, so let's talk if, about a few of the dynamical systems. I can see half of half hour is already gone in the stories. And I'm only on slide 11, and I have 54 slides. <laughs> so, OK, so. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. OK, so let me talk a little bit about the self-excited oscillations in structures or with internal flows. This was the first application of half bifurcation theory. And this was the first application of bifurcations in systems with symmetry. And then bifurcations in systems with broken symmetry. OK? Uh, <clears throat> all right, so here, it, and the simple problem is the garden hose problem. OK, so you have a garden hose. You hold it at one end. You suddenly turn on the faucet. And if this flow rate is sufficiently high, it starts doing wild stuff. OK, so can I predict it? And this is what I will call, in the simplest form, a limit cycle oscillation. And how does this transition from straight flow to limit cycle oscillation take place? OK, so that's the garden hose problem, or fire hose problem. You've seen the um, firefighters have to really hold on to the front end of the pipe really well. Otherwise, it will start going haywire. OK. Now, the key thing is this is a non self adjoint boundary value problem, and it is gyroscopic system. OK. And so it has all the elements that mean that the Static stability theory is not applicable here. It has to be studied in the context of dynamic stability theory. Okay. All right. So here, now of course, this is a system with infinite eigenvalues, okay? Infinite complex eigenvalues. Stability would mean all eigenvalues must remain in the left half plane. And as the eigenvalues cross into the right half plane, then it will be an unstable system. And then my interest is nonlinear. So this means I need to continue and see what happens when the parameters are outside or beyond the critical value for linear stability. Okay. So here is a what they call argon diagram or a root locus or whatever. So this is the imaginary axis. All eigenvalues are imaginary. Just at zero flow rate, they all start on the imaginary axis, infinity of them. So that's one of the issues, right? How do I know that a 99th eigenvalue is not doing something funny. So proving those things is relatively tricky business. Okay. All right, so we start with this. So 
You can do computations, but only for small order eigenvalues. All right, so you start here. As you increase the flow rate, you can see that the first eigenvalue, the third eigenvalue, they're all going into the left half plane, whereas the second eigenvalue first goes into the left half plane, and then it comes out at this flow rate. Okay? So the oscillation of this tube, it, the tube becomes unstable in the second mode. Now, this is really not second mode of the linear undamped vibratory system. It is the second mode of the gyroscopic, linear gyroscopic system. So it's not beam mode. It's a complex combination of many modes in terms of beam modes. Okay? So it's unstable in second mode, uh, pure imaginary eigenvalues. And so if the motion of the tube is in a plane. Now, unfortunately, we could never buy tubes which were straight enough that experimentally they would do planar vibration. Okay? What happens is these tubes get manufactured, and then if there are long tubes, polyacetylene or something, they come in rolls. And it's like a dog's tail. You can never straighten it. Okay? And because you cannot never straighten it, you can never start with a straight tube. Okay? So already there is a perturbation built into it and so forth. So theory verification from experiments is somewhat complicated. Okay? All right. So hopefully it goes into half bifurcation to limit cycle. That's what the expectation from the theory is. So the problem has rich two-parameter problem. Uh, there are two interesting parameters. One is the mass ratio which is in terms of the mass of the fluid versus mass of the tube material, solid. And the other one is actually we discovered something called length ratio. And that had to do something with how long is the tube relative to some Reynolds diameter or something of the, OK? So if the tube is very long, then we had one kind of behavior. At least that's what we predict, predicted. And if the tube is short, the behavior was a different type. Okay? And so we were able to do experiments. Uh, there's another story here, and that story is um, everything in my room upstairs on third floor has been packed up and put in the attic. Unfortunately, it had a eight millimeter tape, which documented this experiment. So. I tried to search for that tape, but so far I have not been able to find okay, where it is in my stuff. Neil, when I took 580 from you, I can verify that that tape exists. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yes, yes. I had, yeah, I had converted that tape into a, a VCR, this thing, video. Okay, but yes. So both of the things are somewhere in the attic. Okay, so what the outcome is? The outcome is, okay, so. There is a supercritical half bifurcation, which essentially means you have stable oscillation in the plane. As the flow rate exceeds some critical value, the amplitude starts growing. The amplitude of this oscillation, the shape of the tube is in the second mode, and the amplitude of oscillation is proportional to the half power of the difference between critical flow rate and where you are. So that's what we were able to prove theoretically. And so it looks like this, essentially. The bifurcating solution, this is only representing amplitude. And if you put it in a, some sort of a reduced order model plane, then you see a limit cycle oscillation. Now in this case, this is called supercritical. And the bifurcating solution is stable. Okay. There is another situation where the bifurcation is subcritical so that there is stable zero solution. There is an unstable solution, and then there is a turning point, and there is a stable solution. Right? So you have, in this range, the linear flow is still stable. Linear, this thing is still stable, but there is an unstable limit cycle, and there is a stable limit cycle. This is called supercritical, uh, subcritical bifurcation. You need to go to higher order terms in your modeling, but it turned out that for small tubes, this is what happens. And for long tubes, this is what happens. So theory predicted that, and we were able to confirm that experimentally. So this is what it says. 
So this is the mass flow rate, uh, um, uh, the mass parameter, this is the length parameter, and these are the three regions in which things take place. And this is the super, so depending on where you are, uh, you can see different behaviors. These circles here represent where we did the experiments, and they worked fine. OK. Now, as I said, we never can find a straight tube, and we can never find a tube which is relatively not circularly symmetric. right? So actually, when we do experiment, either it may do this, or it may start doing this, orbital motion. Okay? And so that was, if the system is symmetric, that's what happens. Now, another discovery, it's really not always that this happens. It depends on, again, the mass ratio, beta square. Okay? So there is an interval here, you can see. So you have two possibilities. You have bifurcation, bifurcation to, this is what is called standing wave. And this is called rotary wave or traveling wave solution. Okay? There is no difference in the system. It's the same physical system with rotational symmetry. So it turned out as a function of beta, there are these three intervals. And <coughs> these, in these intervals, there is an exchange in which, which of the tra whether the traveling wave is stable or the standing wave is stable, that takes place. Now, I have no physical explanation as to what differentiates one region versus other. Okay? Why suddenly a standing wave becomes unstable and a traveling wave becomes stable? Okay? It's just a result of computations, and luckily experiments also verified that. All right. Now, since I can never find a tube which is completely circular, you introduce intentional asymmetry. Intentional asymmetry. So for example, here is a tube with nearly circular section, and we cut out flats on it, which meant that in the two directions, the moment of inertia got changed, okay? which allowed that it's softer in the direction, which would force it to do planar motions. Okay? So that's what we did. So we did it for a tube here for which the circular tube, the traveling wave was stable. And as soon as we introduced this perturbation, now you see that actually standing wave was stable. And then it went underwent a little bit of complex bifurcation process before it changed into traveling wave. So again, this was verified by experiments. So I was quite proud of all this, that theory works in experiments. OK. Uh, there are hundreds of papers on this subject afterwards, lots of experimental work, and so on. And Professor Paidusis and Frank Moon were two of the people, pioneers in this. OK, now let me talk a little bit about resonant structures and modal interactions. <coughs> so it's a relatively busy, this thing, but uh, one of the things in nonlinear dynamical systems is you can always pick one problem at a time. Uh, but uh, that's not fun. Right? You are always looking for unifying principles. What can be a unifying principle? Okay. So for example, here, a spherical pendulum. Right? There's a spherical pendulum. It has a what is called spherical is symmetry this is of rotation. It looks the same, whichever coordinate system I choose, right? Similarly, if I take a string, if I allow, if the string is relatively circular section, it can stay, do this vibration, it can do this vibration, or it could do this. And it is symmetric about the axis, right? Similarly, I can take, instead of a string, I could take a beam. What's the difference between a string and a beam? A string is second order differential equation in space. Beam is a fourth order differential. So it's hyperbolic versus a, what do you call that? Too far away from teaching. So elliptical? No, it's not elliptical. Hyperbolic? No. It's, uh, OK. I'm sure Ganesh and 
Yeah, yeah. No, no. So these are not these are not the classical second order operators. This is a fourth order operator. So this is the okay. So you need to beam equation is that kind of thing. Okay. So in any case, the point is all these systems have a symmetry. So the question is, do all these systems represent the dynamics in a similar way? Yes, it may not be same parameter values. That depends on the physics of the problem. Okay. So most of the time in my research, the idea was always trying to look for these underlying principles of symmetry and whether they shed light on the behavior of the system. Okay. All right. So, <coughs> so these are very classical problems in mechanics. And so I started with string problem and uh, uh, take the spatial discretization. Uh, my always theme was, luckily that's, or unluckily that still holds true, I can't even understand two degree of freedom systems, forget about PDEs, okay? So if I can work with low order dynamical systems and can explain the behavior, I think I'm relatively satisfied with it. Okay, so this is a you know expansion in spatial in, in displacement, why uh, this is allowing both for transfers in the two directions, okay? This vibration or this vibration. Why both directions? So the key thing here is, let's say if I excite the string, apply a transfer force like this, it vibrates like this. In some situations, it starts vibrating like this. So it has standing motion, transfer standing motion, but in some cases, it goes into rotary motion. So under what situation it goes into rotary motion? And this rotary motion arises due to some instability, and that's really, so what we say is there is a mode in this direction, there is a mode in this direction, and under what conditions there is a strong enough coupling between these two modes that it will lead to this behavior. Okay, and most of my life, dynamical system problems that I've looked at, they are all because of this modal coupling of this sort of different types. All right, <coughs> so this is a two mode, here is a two mode model, okay? Z1 and Z2 vector, and Z1 is this motion, Z2 is this motion, amplitude, and there's a harmonic excitation only in this direction. Okay, there is nonlinearity, because otherwise there's no fun. Right? So that's one thing. Secondly, uh, it's really the nonlinearity which causes this coupling. Right? So you can see here z squared times z, this is a cubic nonlinearity stretching of the spring, string. Okay, so we study this. So uh, there is a A1 is the amplitude of in plane motion, A2 is the amplitude of out of plane motion, beta is the frequency of excitation, we are exciting it near resonance frequency, and alpha is damping. So these alpha and beta are the two parameters which play all the games. Okay, uh, so we study it using averaging asymptotic methods, bifurcation theory, numerical bifurcation analysis and continuation tools, something called auto, and study routes to chaos. And the system goes into chaotic behavior, right? So here is a string behavior, so transverse vibration in the plane, this looks like a duffing equation, so you can see for small enough damping, there are these stable periodic motion, a stable periodic motion is the unstable periodic motion. If we increase the, if the increase the forcing amplitude or decrease the damping. So here is damping decreased. Now there is this frequencies beta one and beta five. Between these, the planar motion becomes unstable and it gives rise to this whirling motion. So there is a A1, but now you see an A2 is between beta one and beta five, okay? So that combination of this and this will give rise to whirling, okay? Now, this whirling motion gives rise to really complicated dynamics. So here is for damping 0.513, the same thing as increasing amplitude of excitation. Okay. So, <coughs> so
So this is my some amplitude, and I'm starting to see now this is my beta 1 and beta 2, and now the, this motion under, starts undergoing period doubling bifurcations. So this is period 1, period 2, period... Now, not all period doubling bifurcations lead to chaos. So the sequence reverses back, period 2, 4, and then back to 2 and 1 and so forth. So only in one-dimensional maps which have certain characteristics called Schwarzschild derivatives of certain kinds, that the sequence is complete. Otherwise, nonlinear dynamical systems, it can, okay. So, there are two branches. In this branch, sequence is not complete. It just goes from P1, P2, P4, back to P2, and so forth. So this is basically if you keep exciting at different frequencies. But there is also another branch where the sequence does go into chaos. So here are some periodic orbits in this branch. And you can see period 1, period 2, period 4, and so forth. Okay. So you have period doubling bifurcations, limit cycles, chaos to various types of orbits, something called Rossler, Lorentz, homoclinic orbits, Selnikov, and so forth. Everything can be seen. Where Feigenbaum results known at that time or not yet? Pardon? Where Feigenbaum results known at that time about universality of this, about the scaling behavior? Were they known already or not yet? Yes, they were known. Yes. This is around 1990, oh, 89, 80. So this is a PhD student's work starting in 87 till 90. Okay. Yes. But again, they're only for one-dimensional maps, logistic map and so on. Or two-dimensional with conservation. So, yes. Right. <coughs> well, that was the motivation. Can I see the route to chaos? Right, as a simple period doubling bifurcation. Of course, no. There is Silnikov method, route to chaos as well, right? taking place. Okay, so for Silnikov behavior, you have to show the existence of um, homoclinic orbits, and then certain eigenvalues of the fixed points, ratios, and so on criteria can be built. So here is a uh, for the single periodic period solution branch. You can see how the period of the solution is going to infinity. So somewhere at this value of the frequency, there is a homoclinic orbit, essentially. And if you study some more carefully the study, uh, properties of that homoclinic orbit, you can show that there is a Silnikov behavior. Okay. Uh, so again, there is this Rossler type solutions. They merge into Lorentz type solutions, and so on. Okay. There was, you know, in those days, fancy words were being created. Chaotic attractors, of course. Uh, something called crisis, right? Crisis is a phenomenon in which some attractor gets destroyed by its touching the basic boundaries of or the stable manifolds of some other unstable equilibria, okay? Now, detecting it is a trick or painstaking process. So we were able to detect, in the case of the string motions, there is the chaotic behavior. And then if I slightly change the parameter frequency here, that this attractor is destroyed. So destroyed means I start here for a long time. It keeps going like this. Suddenly, it comes very close to the stable manifold of this saddle point, and it goes to here. Uh, as I said, lots of problems exhibit similar behavior. Okay. So here is in spherical pendulum. This is what the response curve looks like. And these are the freak, you know, plan non-planar branches. And we showed that the same kind of period doubling bifurcations and so on takes place here. Similarly, motion of the beam. Okay. So <coughs> And this is just a evidence of some of that. So there is time up. Uh, I think I have three, four more minutes. And no, I want to give people the opportunity to ask questions. OK. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about order reduction in dynamical systems. 
Of course, here I did already order reduction. Everybody saw. I started with infinite number of modes of the beam. I only kept two modes. Well, at least asymptotic theory, I could show that all the other modes decay if there is sufficient damping. They all go to zero, okay? Because they are not being directly excited either through external forcing or through coupling with the other modes due to nonlinear coupling. In the case of strings, it is relatively easy because all the frequencies are in multiples. But in the case of beams and so on, whether higher order resonances arise, which are called combination resonances and so on, that's not so easy to prove analytically. Okay? All right. So in most nonlinear systems, the idea is still looking for can I reduce the problem, size of the problem? So I can study a small order system, okay, predict something about it because I can study smaller order systems more easily, and then conclude something about the larger system. Okay. So uh, again, looking at using singular perturbation theory, geometric singular perturbation theory, uh, externally excited system with multiple well potentials. In those days, it was fashionable to study multiple well potentials, show chaos, and so forth and Melnikov analysis for one degree of freedom or two degree of freedom systems could be done. And for analysis for higher order systems is quite difficult. Okay, so how can we arrive at reduced order systems? If the reduced order system exhibits chaotic behavior, does the original system also do? Okay, so I worked with Martin Corless in Aero and we used singular perturbation theory and Giorgio was the PhD student. And we took this starting example. So it's a two degree of freedom system, this mass and this mass. This base is excited with harmonic oscillation. So we could reduce it to a two degree of freedom system, introduce a, to a small parameter, which is the ratio of natural frequency of one or the other, okay? Omega one over omega. And this, if mu is small, one could show that there are two oscillators. The two oscillators, one has low frequency, the other is high frequency, and so one can call soft oscillator and stiff oscillator, okay? And so the motion equations become something like this. X dot equals, this is the soft oscillator, this is the stiff oscillator. And then there is a theory, you can say existence of slow manifolds and fast manifolds and so forth. In the end, with the bottom line. So we get motion on slow manifold and say, if I can capture motion on slow manifold, the fast manifold is a slave. It follows the slow manifold, whatever is happening on the slow manifold, right? It's not zero, but okay. So here is the response of the system, predictions. If the system has periodic motion, so there are two curves here, you can see one is the original system, two degree of freedom system. The other one is the single degree of freedom reduced order model. And you can see how they faithfully produce depending on the value of the parameter mu, okay? Well, this is not chaos. These are just periodic orbits. So here is the chaotic orbit, okay? So this is for zeroth order approximation and uh, this is for the full system. So the chaotic orbits look relatively quite Good. So we could prove then that one degree of freedom system does represent the full order system's behavior reasonably. Okay. Okay. <coughs> All right. Um, so I don't want to leave this. Uh, I mean, this is an area in which seat occupant dynamics, Professor. Davies, Patricia, and myself have spent now somewhere around 17, 18 years, okay? Work with support from Johnson Controls and NSF and so on. So at least I wanted to give you a flavor of what that is, right? So foam is a complicated material. So it represents creep, and it has long-term and short-term constants significantly. Then if I just take a foam block and compress and uncompress, it shows this significant amount of hysteretic behavior. And I'm not talking about small amplitude compression. So it's like 
I take a three inch block, reduce it to one inch. So it's around 70%, 67% and then bring it back to okay, three inch. And so this is the compression versus force and you can see that there is, I can't call something as a linear stiffness of the foam, there is a significant amount of nonlinearity in it. Okay? And this is as, now we were working with three different types of foam in the car seat. This was the Dodge car seat and so you can see the blue, <coughs> blue we were calling soft foam and then intermediate foam and red is stiffer foam. Okay, so here is some simple modeling of a car seat. Now, of course, we can do finite element modeling. It's not so straightforward. There are lots of different issues, right? Uh, so first thing wanted to predict, can we predict if I put a dummy in the car seat, where does this dummy settle down in the car seat? And the car seat has foam seats and seat back, okay? And <clears throat> so can we do that? And the foam is highly nonlinear material, depends on temperature and humidity. So if your car is parked in Arizona versus in Alaska, the occupant is going to settle in different positions in the car seat. Okay? All right. Uh, <coughs> so this settling point is called the H point location, and it also determines what the pressure distribution between the occupant and the seat is. So those are important things, right? And then dynamically, if you excite the seat, then it's called these seat to head transmissibility and apparent mass and all that stuff. Okay, so just as a caricature, here is an occupant sitting on the car seat. What happens? If I take the occupant and put him on the car seat, so I just put the occupant by these three rods, well, these rods start deforming and they are only linked at the joints, okay? So rigid bodies. So that's how something like this takes place. And so the static equilibrium position, this is how one can determine some sort of a, of the, and this point is called the edge point of this, okay? Car manufacturers give this edge point because that's what determines the location of all the controls in the car seat. Okay, so that's what they give to the car seat manufacturers and say, now produce a seat which meets these specifications relative to the interior of the car. Okay. okay, as you can see immediately, this will depend on what? Not only the firm, who the occupant is. A 25-year, 25-pound kid versus a 500-pound person. Okay, the equilibrium positions will be quite different. Okay, so the modeling framework, we developed a modeling framework, which the main elements of the seat occupant system, different physics based on the models, uh, seating foam characterized by constitutive nonlinear foam material as we said last week. The other complicated thing is interfaces. The occupant sits on the seat, well, occupant slides relatively, you're not glued together, so we can't say it's a multi-degree of freedom system like this, right? So, uh, Anyway, so we try to develop a model. Um, so you can see this is the initial position of the occupant, and after 10 seconds, it has gone to some this thing, right? So this model has some prediction capabilities. Let's see. And of course, I should have thought about it, right? Because I copied the slide onto the stick. There went my... Yes, okay, anyway. Learn lessons. So here is an experiment with a mat, right? So you can have pressure mat. And so in the Envision Center with the dummy, this experiment was done, and this is the pressure distribution underneath the occupant. And so if you do some post-processing, this is how the pressure distribution looks like along the center line of the occupant. Our model is planar, so it's only on the center line, and so this is what our model prediction looks like. Not too bad, OK? 
Okay, with all the approximations and so on. We have improved on this significantly now with additional modeling efforts and so on. Okay, so let me spend five minutes on my role in the administration of the surveys or administration. So I became graduate chair in 1998 courtesy of Professor Frank in Copera, and that was before he had announced that he was going to Notre Dame as the dean, okay? Like two months before that, okay. Uh, then when Fr Frank, uh, Dan Harleman came, he decided to upgrade the position to associate head for graduate education and research. Uh, Paul Swika was the first chair of the research committee, and so that was in 2001, okay. And then, <clears throat> so these are some of the things I was privileged to be able to do with our faculty. We went from around 238 students to around 515 students in that period, directed, developed a direct PAD program. PAD enrollment went from around 30% to 60% in the school, com developed a combined BSMS, and helped do some of these things. Okay. Then I became the interim head of the school in 2010, September, August, September. And in uh, May 2011, I was appointed the head of the school. The greatest achievement or contribution to the school, hopefully positively, okay, only time will tell, is the people that I have recruited to the faculty, right? And so you can see, uh, there is, I, I thought I'll not put the names and make an effort to try to remember the names, all right? So this is Tahira, this is Jitesh, Rebecca, Dave, this is Amy, this is Pavlos, that's Marcial, that's Arzu, um, this is Iliad, this is Gilerma, that's KG, that's Carlo, that's Song, that's Benshin, that's Nira, this is Fabio, this is Andres, that's James, that's Ivan, that's Terry, that's Chris, that's Adrian, that's Liang, and that's Carlo. Right? Pardon? Carlo is twice. Is that twice? <laughs> well, I kept going back and forth between the two slides to see, <laughs> am I repeating anybody? OK. So there are eight in each line, so that's uh, 23 tenure track, full time in ME, and there, the, here are the four joint appointments. That's Liang, <coughs> ah, uh, Guang Lin, and that's Ed, and that's Chi Wan, and that's our friend. He will, he was really as visiting assistant professor, and uh, will become the regular. OK. So here are the collaborators. Right? They have quite a few, of course, so many years, 35 years here. Uh, lots of people have touched my life. Of course, I don't remember everyone who has touched my life. Uh, some people I remember very fondly. I remember when I was going up for promotion for full professor. Uh, professor Henry Yang, he was the dean. He called me in his office and said, um, don't hear to any rumors that you won't be promoted. <laughs> OK. And uh, I just uh, was called by. So I don't know how many of you know what the process is for promotion to full professor or even to other any promotion. The University Promotion Committee has these 90, 100, 120 applications for promotion from across campus. The members of the committee read and they vote. And those who clear two thirds vote, they are not discussed in the university panel. Only those, and then those who receive less than one third, they are also not considered in the university panel. The one between one-third and two-third, they are considered by the university panel. Unless somebody, member says, I would like to discuss this so-and-so case. 
other than those, that's the, right? So I guess my case was in that one third to two third case, and Henry Yang was asked to say something about is he a good guy or not, and so on. Okay. So anyway, I don't know the rest of the story. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> quite a few colleagues who have helped me. Um, of course, Osita is no more. He passed away in 1997 or 90, 98 or so, 99. Um, lots of graduate students who have helped. And there are uh, many sponsors who supported some of this research. OK. Uh, I missed out on many people and many areas of research. Okay. Um, so I studied eigenvaluating and mode localization with Osita, brake squeal, modeling and prediction with Chuck, flow-induced vibrations with Arvind, nonlinear MEMS modeling, uncertainty analysis with Marisol and Arvind, optimal design of nonlinear MEMS, and uncertainty quantification, and so on. Okay. Thank you. I think our host is <laughs> Melba. Yes, I think so. So the car seat uh, phenomena you demonstrated is very fascinating. Uh, now what happens is uh, we have uh, ability to change the car seat uh, height and backside. So oh, yeah. the edge factor is changing accordingly. Yes. So what happens is we did some research on that. So basically, where even where you place the occupant. Right, I enter the car, I don't exactly sit at the same place. Right? So my location in the car seat, two inches front, two inches back, or I go and hit the seat back, and so on. All that changes the edge point. Now, it's not that critical how much edge point gets located. It's really the comfort level of the occupant. The more important other thing is, how does it affect then the dynamics of the ride and as you travel on the car? this in the car, and whether you are doing short trips or long trips and so on, because that affects your fatigue and so forth, okay? So we have the capability now, the models, to really do all the dynamics and predict all those quantities. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, so are you, uh, um, did you contribute or are you guilty of making any of those names that got real? popular in the early 90s, like the chaotic whatever, and the, I mean, interesting names, a crisis pointer, I can't remember them, but. No, I did not create guilty. those names. Okay. I did not create those names. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm not surprised, I'm not surprised. Why? I don't know. Not capable of creating those names? No, no, I didn't say that, Neil, I'm sure you could have. <laughs> <laughs> I usually, I hate to reproduce or I hate to give my own names to things that people have already, the thing. And I don't like people who don't look at the literature, explore the literature before coming up with their own names. And I know of many such things that bother me. Of renaming. Yeah. Yes. And then the technical meaning should be the same for all things. That is the same like, you know, chaos. What the hell is chaos? Right? So I feel quite agitated when lots of people use the word chaos without explicitly, clearly stating what do they mean by it. Do they only see a wiggly curve and they call that a chaotic looking trajectory? Okay, once they add the adjective looking, okay, I can live with it. But if they say chaos, and you can find lots of such things. Yeah. That's the response I was looking for. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you very much, colleagues. My pleasure. <laughs>